I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you, but how I caught it, found it, or came by it. What stuff it is made of, whereof it is born. I am to learn. Such a want which sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There where your Argus is with portly sail like seniors and rich burghers on the flood. Or as it were, the pageants of the sea do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. <clears throat> Believe me, sir, had I such ventures forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still uh, plucking the grass. But you know, where sits the wind? Peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures, out of doubt, would make me sad. My wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague when I thought what harm a wind too great might do at sea. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, veiling her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. But I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices on the stream, enrobe the roaring waters with my silks, and in a word, but even now worth this, and now worth nothing. <clears throat> shall I have the thought to think on this? And shall I lack the thought that such a thing by chance would make me sad? But tell not me, I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. <laughs> Believe me, no. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place. Nor is my whole estate upon the fortunes of this present year. Therefore, my, my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then you are in love. Oh, fire. Oh, not in love, neither. Then let us say you are sad because you are not merry. <laughs> and where it's easy for you to laugh and leap and say you are merry because you are not sad. Mm. Now, by two-headed Janus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time. Some that will evermore peep through their eyes and laugh like parrots at a bagpiper, and others of such vinegar aspect, they'll not show their teeth in way of smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. Uh, uh, here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman. <laughs> Graciano and Lorenzo. Fare you well. We'll leave you now with better company. I should have stayed till I'd made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. But your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you, and you, you embrace the occasion to depart. Good morrow, my good lord. Good signors, both when shall we laugh? Say when. You grow exceeding strange. Must it be so? We'll make our leisures to attend on yours. <laughs> 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 my lord Pisanio, since you found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you, have in mind where we must meet. I will not fail you. You look not well, signor Antonio. With too much respect upon the world. They lose it, they do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvellously changed. I hold the world but as the world, Graciano. A stage where every man must play a part, and mine a sad one. <laughs> well, let me play the fool. With mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come, and let my liver rather heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire, cut in alabaster, sleep when he wakes and creep into the jaundice by being peevish. I tell thee what, Antonio, I love thee in it. It is my love that speaks. There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond and do a willful stillness entertain with purpose to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit. As who should say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I open my lips, let no dog bark. <laughs> oh, my Antonio, I do know of these that therefore only are reputed wise for saying nothing. But I'm very sure if they should speak, would almost damn those ears, which hearing them will call their brothers fools. <laughs> I'll tell thee more of this another time. But fish not with this melancholy bait, for this fool's gudgeon, this opinion. Come, good Lorenzo, fare you well a while. I'll end my exhortation after dinner. <laughs> well, we will leave you then till dinner time.
I must be one of these same dumb wise men, for Gratiano never lets me speak. No, oh, keep me company but two years more, thou shalt not know the sound of thine own tongue. <laughs> so farewell, I'll grow a talker for this gear. Oh, thanks, you, Faith. For silence is only commendable in a neat tongue dried and a maid not vendable. <laughs> <laughs> Is that anything, no? Oh, Graciano speaks an infinite deal of nothing more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day ere you'll find them, and when you have them, they're not worth the search. Oh. Well, tell me now. What lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? It is not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant continuance. Nor do I now make moan to be abridged from such a noble rate, but my chief care is to come fairly off from those great debts wherein my time something too prodigal hath left me gauged. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and, and in love. And from your love I have a warranty to unburthen all my plots and purposes how to get clear of all the debts I owe. Well, I pray you, good Bassanio, let me know it. And if it stands as you yourself still do, within the eye of honour, be assured my, my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasions. In my school days, when I had lost one shot, I shot his fellow of the self-same flight the self-same way, with more advised watch to find the other fourth. And by adventuring both, I oft found both. I, I urge this childhood proof for what follows is pure innocence. I owe you much. And like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to shoot another arrow that self-way, which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt as I shall watch the aim, or to find both or bring your latter hazard back again, and thankfully rest debtor for the first. You know me well. And herein spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance. And out of doubt you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost, than if you had made waste of all I have. Then do but say to me what I should do. That in your knowledge may by me be done. I am pressed unto it. Therefore, speak. In Belmont is a lady richly left. And she is fair, and fairer than that word of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair speechless messages. Her name is Portia. Nothing undervalued to Cato's daughter, Brutus Portia. What is the wide world ignorant of her worth? For the four winds blow in from every coast renowned suitors. And her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece, which make her seat of Belmont culture strand. And many Jasons come in quest of her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Mm. Well, thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore, go forth. Try what my credit can in Venice do. That shall be racked even to the uttermost to furnish thee to Belmont, the fair Portia. I go presently inquire and say, will I, where money is. And I no question make to have it of my trust or, or my sake. 